Most of my work is done in Vermont. I'm in charge of uh, essentially finding uh, opportunities to harvest timber in, in uh, stands of timber that are ready to be harvested, uh, mature timber, uh, of which there are many on these lands. And once I find those harvestable units, uh, I write a plan to describe those units. Uh, we comply with all sorts of uh, layers, uh, the, the use value of appraisal program, which is the current use program in Vermont. We, uh, we have a conservation easement. And then once the plans are approved by the appropriate uh, regulatory authorities, then I'm in charge of executing the timber sale on the ground, which is my favorite part, is hanging the flagging, marking the trees, and supervising the logging operation, which I love to do. There's great guys in these woods. Once I find the harvestable unit, I will uh, go through some stereo photography analysis of the tract, uh, look at the contours, determine whether or not the skid is within, you know, the skid, the timber skid is within half, three quarters of a mile. And if it's not, then uh, we'll need road to reach it. And so I lay out, I will go out, lay out the roads in the woods, try to keep the percentage of slope to a minimum amount, which is sometimes difficult in mountainous country. Once the roads are established in a, in a tract of land, say we pick a harvest unit, we put the road in, we've got a tract of 200 acres up off the roadside to our right. It's various terrain, various timber types. What, what you'd first do is establish where your landing was going to be for these big, heavy objects that you're going to be handling. You know, trees are, you know, a ton, ton and a half a piece, and they, they come into the yard, and they're long, and they're difficult to handle, and you need a lot of room to handle them. So you establish landings, and once you know where your landing is going to be, and you can flag that out for cutting that out later, you flag the perimeter of that, you cut that out, and then stump it and use that ground as your as your uh, center point. So once that's once the, the landings are located then you start to lay out your main skid system and that involves running you know trails that are that can be parallel with the road or work with the contours of the land so that there's the slopes aren't too steep but that the tracked vehicles, the tracked feller bunchers can, can go on these areas. I mean, they, you can't run a tracked feller buncher on a 30% slope this way. It just doesn't go side hill that way. So you've got to be able to figure out how to get those tracked vehicles in, and you flag, the, you flag each skid trail with orange flagging. We have a protocol for flagging, and you track, you flag those locations out, you flag each stream buffer. We have a policy about streams, buffers, you know, 50-foot buffers on um, most perennial streams, all perennial streams, actually. And then, you know, on intermediate streams or intermittent streams, there's a little bit different policy. You still got the buffer, but you, you can operate in the buffer and so on and so forth. So you put in your main skid, your main skid system, and, and some spurs off your skid system. Your, um, your buffer system, your blue line flagging, we call it, blue for water. And then uh, you'd put in your harvest boundary in uh, a pink. A pink is a, that's where, uh, that's where the harvesting ends, is on the pink line. So you've got your orange, your blue, your pink. And silvicultural boundaries where I determine, you know, maybe I want to, uh, thin this parcel, parcel over here, but this parcel has a lot of unacceptable growing stock, and maybe I'll put a small patch cut here where the, the timber growth isn't so, uh, isn't so good and it probably should be started over again. So those are the kinds of things that I do on the ground as a rule before the, before the logging crew shows up. The relationship that we have is I will show them the map, give them a copy, usually give them a GPS with the, the wholesale on it and uh, 
they know the routine. They know that orange flagging is skid trails. They know that blue paint means the tree leaves the site. We have a protocol with blue and orange paint. When you mark the trees in blue, those go. And you mark them in orange, they stay. So a lot of times we'll, uh, we'll have a, a small patch cut and we'll leave a, a dominant, you know, an excellent dominant tree in, in that somewhere, in that patch for seed source. Um, and the, the relationship that I have with the loggers is basically show them what to do and those guys execute. And uh, we work together on many of these things. Uh, we put crossings in together. We have bridges that we cross streams with. We have other manner of crossings, pole crossings that we use occasionally on smaller streams. And we work with those guys to describe what we want for a crossing. And they'll execute that. And uh, the relationship is really very good. We're dealing with a lot of, of, a lot of guys who are my age now. Um, they're older, more experienced, really, um, really experienced, and you got to give these guys credit for what they know because they're brilliant. Many of them are brilliant. They're just blue collar brilliant guys. They really are. I think there's a really promising future for young people in the business because there's so many of us that are going to age out shortly. Uh, the only the only real downside I see for the, for the youth is that uh, what bank is going to hand over uh, $10 million for equipment purchases? That's, that's their biggest hurdle, I think. That would seem to me the biggest hurdle. Who's going to hand over that kind of money to make uh, these, equipment, uh, uh, you know, these equipment purchases possible? There's a lot of opportunity there. There's a lot of opportunity. Our, uh, the, the contractors, the logging contractors I work with are always looking for new young talent. Like I said, most of the guys in, in the business are my age. And um, maybe somebody doesn't want to go to college right off the hop. Maybe they don't want to go to college at all. And, and, and maybe if they have an interest in uh, heavy equipment. Uh, my God, what, what better place to be interested in heavy equipment than a place, than, a, than an industry that has, you know, all kinds of heavy equipment to operate. And some of these kids, uh, there's a couple of kids on, on kids, 22, 23 year olds that are, that work on my projects and they're absolute geniuses with uh, this equipment. And I, I constantly tell them, uh, or ask them, how did you get so good with this stuff? I mean, some of these guys can pick a dime off the ground with a grapple skitter. It's, it's remarkable. So they, they just say, well, you know, I, I was interested in it. Uh, my father had an excavator. He let me run it. And uh, I got pretty good at it. And then, uh, you know, I decided to try and run it. You know, I answered an ad in a paper for a skitter operator, and I ended up running a skitter. And then I... I graduated to a delimmer and, uh, and then uh, into the harvester itself and you know the harvester is really a, a key piece of the puzzle for us they're the guys that we that we look at and say okay here's the plan execute and the, the, and the grapple skitter guys they have a critical role too because they've got to be able to maintain their trails and and the young kids today that are so talented with this equipment I mean Every contractor is looking for, for young guys that can run equipment.
time with my father, just very little. And uh, like I said, after he passed away, I don't know, maybe a year later, my mother sold the farm and uh, we moved to Orleans there. And uh, my heart was kind of in farming, so I stayed with some friends in Brankton. I grew up there part time with them. And then uh, I guess when I was 18 or so, I thought I wanted to play mechanic. So I worked at a garage outside of Orleans there for, I don't know, five or six years. And, then we went to logging. You know, I used to play on weekends doing firewood and stuff. And I had a little old C3 tree farmer skitter I used to play with. And I don't know. And then I got in with uh, Wagner Woodlands. And uh, they was going to give me a contract. So I went and leased a skitter for nine months. And I never looked back. I just stepped rolling from there. So right now, there's just four of us um, me. My son-in-law, my future son-in-law, and my brother. I've been working for Plum Creek, I believe it's around eight years. We've, we've done a lot of work for them, yeah, and uh, they've been awful good to us. Yeah. Um, for the last probably six years or so, I worked solely for Plum, you know. I used to run six, seven different pieces of equipment on them, you know. But, um, we're starting to getting our golden years, I guess you'd call it. So I'm trying to mellow out a little bit, you know. I mean, we still try to keep everybody happy, but that's where we're headed. That's a hardwood log, and we're going to Groton, a catamount yard down there with that. And our pulp, and there's ash pulp and everything, that's going to Buffalo Mountain in Hardwick or down to the catamount yard. Uh, our softwood is going to Hardwick, our softwood log is going to Hardwick, and our softwood pulp and stuff goes to J Main. Of course, you hear bits and pieces, but my opinion, I guess it's still always going to be here. We might have to log a little smarter, which I think we're trying to with our cut to length and stuff like that. It's just, you might have to diversify a little bit, you know, like we do firewood, you know, and that helps us from flooding some of our pulp mills, you know. We, we try to do a few hundred quarter firewood a year. That helps us there. Uh, finding new markets, you, you know, we're, we're always trying to find new markets. It's, it's hard, no, I mean, if you're going to get help, you're going to have to teach them, you know, especially with this newer equipment we got now, you know, it's not like somebody with a chainsaw and go cut a tree, you know, we, well, I don't even have a chainsaw on a job, you know, we, we don't use them anymore, very rarely we use a chainsaw, and so there's a lot of learning curves, you know, you're into your computers and everything nowadays, and, but with this here, you know, I mean, I can set it up for seven different operators, and, my son-in-law with that one, it's it's just unreal what you got to know to run it, you know what I mean? You got to know how to calibrate your computers and stuff like that. So but This machine my son-in-law runs in the woods, we call it the Harvester 2, and uh, he goes up to a tree, he grabs onto it, cuts it down. As it hits the ground, he's got wheels, spins it up, and he's got a computer inside. He's watching his computer for the diameter of the tree, which we don't really do much logs. If we do a pallet log, it's going to be eight inch, but it's going to be a nice smooth tree. And his machine will tell him the diameter of the tree so he knows he's eight inch inside the bark. And if it's a nice smooth tr log, his other gauge there, I'm not familiar with the machine, but I know it runs. His other thing will tell him the length. You know, he wants it eight six. So the machine will spit it up to eight six. He'll cut it off. That's a good tie log, you know, or 16 foot for pulp, you know. I mean, it's his judgment on what he wants to put that tree into, but his machine will tell him the diameters that he needs to know to make his marks.
I'll take my forwarder, I'll you'll have piles all through the woods. I go pick them up and bring them out. Then my brother here unloads me and he'll sort them in the landing, which mill we want him to go to. So and then when the truck comes in, my brother loads them. Plum Plum Creek, they they tell us where to market it. I, I actually get a quota every Sunday night, I believe, or email to me what markets I can use that week, you know. Uh, with them, we have a tie log market, which is in Coventry, Vermont. It's uh, La Branche Lumber. We go to there. Uh, they have another tie log market for a smaller tie log in uh, Maine. It's Isaacson's in above Jay, Maine. And then we have what they call a mat log market, which is a 16-foot hardwood that doesn't make a quite make a saw log, and that goes to Maine. I think it's Bethel, Maine and they make uh, bridge mats out of it, which a lot of loggers use in the woods. And they make the bridge panels and stuff. And then uh, we have saw logs on plum, which go to Shampoo in Canada. That's your hardwood saw log. And then we have the veneer, which uh, goes to Columbia Forest in Newport. And then if we get into the softwood logs, they all go to Milan, uh, New Hampshire. And the pulp has been going to, the softwood pulp has been going to Sappy and Skelhegan. And the hardwood pulp either goes to Sappy and Skelhegan or Domtar in Windsor, Quebec. If we had to train somebody to run, like, say, my son in law's piece of equipment, you, you, you're going to have at least a month to two month learning curve, you, you know, because there's a lot of stuff you, that, that in, entails. And then you're really pushing it, you know. I mean, it, if you get six to eight months under your belt, then you should be an operator. You know, you should know whether you're going to make it by then. And the forwarder, I don't know. I picked it up in probably three weeks where I could manage to make a living with it. It's not for everybody, but, uh, I, you know, I managed, so I guess a lot of people could. I mean, they'd be better off to try and get in with a bigger firm and just to learn today's logging, you know, it's so much different than it was years ago. Uh, you can't jump on a skidder and a chainsaw and go across the brook. There's just so many laws nowadays has changed. You know, if anybody really wanted to get in and do it right, they should get it with a bigger firm and learn the right way to do it, you know, before they want to step out on their own. I like to have all my guys at least to have a CDL license so they can drive dump truck and you know somebody that can run heavy equipment that's had some experience and we usually have like to have at least one laborer on our crew which pretty much everybody kind of does a little bit of everything nobody has just one job in our peak season the summertime there's about six and next year we're hoping to add at least one more so it'll be seven guys employed we usually put an ad in with the uh, unemployment office and usually have sometimes advertise in the newspaper. Most time you can usually find somebody by doing that. You know, people will come and see you. And was brought up on a dairy farm just down the road here and my father always had a dozer and stuff and in 86 we had an auction and he always did side work anyway. So we just kind of started in the excavating business. And as years went on, we uh, got a little bit busier and he just kind of got sick of doing the paperwork and meeting with the customers. And I actually bought him out 19 years ago. 
and he actually worked for me up until about four years ago. Now we semi-retired. We have three excavators, a dozer, a loader, and four dump trucks. Pretty much all excavating work we do dig foundations, put in septic systems, uh, build driveways, and of course we build a lot of roads for Plum Creek, you know, graveling roads and building green roads for the, you know, so they can get logs out. We don't really have a set area. I know a lot of guys don't usually travel too far from home, but we, most everywhere we work for Plum Creek is anywhere from, you know, a 20 mile ride in the morning to a 50, 52 mile ride. We build a lot of their roads, fixing up old logging roads that were used for trucking um, that haven't been used in a while. We'll go in with a brush head of the excavator, you know, trim all the brush back and then we'll re-gravel it, change all the culverts and we also build green roads, you know, they'll go in, log a section of road out and then we'll come in and we'll stump it, put the ditches in, culverts and then gravel it so it can be used for, you know, the log trucks. After Hurricane Irene we did work for the town of Ludlow for eight weeks rebuilding all their roads down there, replacing culverts and so pretty much we'll go just about anywhere. We do quite a bit of town work um, for municipal. We do a lot of state work. We do a lot of residential too, you know, like I said, digging foundations, septics, driveways, stuff like that. It's getting tougher with help is our main thing. Um, it seems like the younger generation's really not into, you know, what we do, the long hours, you know, the hard work, it's definitely finding help is a big problem. I do have a couple guys that were trained by myself, but most of the guys came from other places. And uh, as of right now, we've got probably the best crew I've ever had. I don't, I think it's getting harder for anybody with a small business. I would hate to think this day and age I was gonna start over like I did 19 years ago. I, I don't think you could do it financially and I don't know with all the stress and everything else, I don't know if I'd wanna do it. Like this dozer here, brand new is about 150,000. That machine right behind me here, that brand new was about 250. Pretty much, we do most everything right through our local bank here in town, but most of the times if the equipment companies usually sometimes run a really good deal on interest, so we'll finance right through like Caterpillar or, or Volvo, but most everything is right through the local bank.
guess I got into the trucking business way back when I had the farm with one dump truck. I had one dump truck. And then that led to more. And I think I had five or six dump trucks that I worked also. And, and it just seems to keep growing. And then as we get into the milk business, I had 28 milk tankers, so I don't remember how many trucks I had, but I had more than that. And we picked up all of us, the milk from all the farms, and and that grew to the sawdust business, so that added more units. And, and then that turned to the mulch business, so one thing led to another, and we just kept... Uh, growing on to the different products and, and developing markets for it. But I'm very fortunate I've got help. Some of them have been here almost 30 years. It's, we're just fortunate on the help. The good help we have is good help. But truck drivers are a different situation. If you can keep one for four or five years, you're doing pretty good. I'm Kevin Barrett, I'm Rodney Barrett's son, and I'm the active manager, co-owner of uh, Barrett Farms Incorporated. My grandparents had a farm, and then my dad had a farm, and I've, uh, I've worked basically with my dad ever since I was small. He uh, had an international harvester dealership for a while, I didn't have much participation in that, but when he had the farm, I was uh, I did milk a few cows and I cleaned barns and fed cows and run the silage trucks and fed calves and all that stuff. And then when he uh, sold that business and got into the milk hauling business, I was kind of uh, fascinated with the trucks, so I would uh, ride with him quite often and, and get some learning from that. And then he let me drive a few times, and then I, I guess I caught the bug. And I've had trucks in my system ever since then. We do quite a wide variety of trucking. We uh, are mainly in the mulch business, so we haul mulch all over the eastern coast, as far down as Delaware, as far west as Ohio. We have another terminal in uh, East Windsor, Connecticut, and one in Tawako, New Jersey, that we reload out of. And uh, we do backhauls for a lot of different companies up here, including uh, Columbia Forest Products. We do some veneer, we do some animal feed. We haul a little bit of asphalt for, for Pike Industries, Old Castle. Uh, we we kind of do a variety of, of a little bit of everything. Just the trucks, we've got 30 trucks, so we, we have 30 drivers, and then we have uh, three full-time mechanics and two welders, and that's just for the trucking part of it. We do have some other employees that work in the yard here in the manufacturing sector. Besides the two trucks that work for Plum Creek primarily, we have five other trucks that haul wood for private individuals. 
and uh, we, we, we haul for some of the larger wood contractors, self-employed contractors in the, in the area. Plus we have our, uh, a chipping crew that goes out and chips wood for biomass also. As far as wood truck drivers, we probably get experience most of the time. And we've had some people that have come in here and we've, we've trained them. We have one employee that's been here for almost uh, 20 years. Uh, he started off when he was 15 years old here. And uh, he's been, he, we've trained him and he's basically can run every aspect of the company. He's, he's capable. And we've had a few others that we've brought in as green as greenhorns and trained them. But it's, we've, now we're, we're kind of look for, it, it takes a special kind of person to go in the woods. You just can't take any truck driver and put them in the woods. It's, uh, it's kind of a special breed, so to speak, which is, is getting very, very hard to find because these kind of drivers came off the farms and there's very few farmers left, so to speak. So it's, it's very hard to find a good person to go in the woods. Woodridge Lumber actually began in 1974, which is many years ago, uh, on this piece of land here in Albany. And the mill got started um, because we wanted to build a log home of our own. And um, worked with the farmer down the road that was doing harvesting up behind the mill here. And we said, well, we will help you all winter get the logs out and instead of payment, let's save out some 9 and 10 inch diameter logs for our log home. Uh, we had been living in a mobile home and thought the, the dream home was a log home. So when we uh, got the logs all together and spring came, we had the pile of logs and the light bulb went off. Wouldn't it be fun to saw our own logs? So that was probably a dangerous question because uh, after we thought about it and found a used sawmill over in Glover, not too far from here. 
a bell saw on a hay wagon with a tarp over it and it was a bargain for five hundred dollars so that was a big purchase and got it home uh, took it to the farmers uh, yard down below and it needed uh, a tractor to run run the blade and hooked the tractor up the PTO and we found out that the good buy of five hundred dollars was uh, maybe not quite such a good buy as we thought because they were missing parts and not having money at our disposal to buy these parts we did uh, look at that log pile and actually sold the logs that originally were going into the home for parts and had a sawmill that was workable and that was in 1974 and set up on Route 14 a little bit uh, below where we are sitting now and uh, used tin poles and this bell saw with a neighbor's tractor and uh, in 1974 a lot of railroad beds were being replaced and uh, a mill in Hardwick could not saw the hardwood railroad ties fast enough. So we did some custom sawing of hardwood, the 6x8s and 7x9s for him. So that actually started our sawmill career. We started out with the hardwood railroad ties, operated down in the, the mill yard, we call it, down below for a couple years, and then moved up to the site where we are now and had another uh, mill building. And we switched to softwood and pine and a little bit of cedar. And what we noticed was that although the softwood and pine were readily available in log form, they were more of a commodity item. The softwood logs often uh, went up through Route 14 into Canada, were processed and sent back to the U.S. and sold for less than what we could process that same log from our hillside. So we knew that this was not a long-term uh, profitable venture. Pine was a good commodity item, but the cedar was a little unique in the fact that it grew locally and we felt that being involved in a local product, a specialty product, a natural product, very decay resistant, bug resistant, very beautiful, that it was a specialty area that would bode well for us. So in 1985, we switched strictly to cedar. Goodridge Lumber currently has eight full-time employees and my sister who works two days a week in the office. We have changed mills a couple different times, the actual sawmill that we mill the logs on. Um, we have a chase hydraulic carriage and an edger, a sash saw from Sweden that is thin kerf blades, so we're saving as much wood as possible when we're cutting. So we, we have our employees, we buy our raw material from over a hundred different landowners uh, loggers and truckers on a yearly basis. Our vendor list is 300 plus, but there are usually 100 folks that are doing uh, harvesting. And we are unique in the sense that um, we get our material from a 75 mile radius, which is a, a very local area. And the cedar generally grows in swampy areas. So the challenge is uh, Mother Nature needs to give us some good cold weather in the winter. 80% of our product that we year use yearly, 80% is brought in during the winter months from December until mud time.
The owners of the Goodridge Lumber Corporation are myself and my three sons, Doug, Mark, and Brian. They all play very important roles. We uh, have lots of different skills that are used in our business here. Doug, my oldest son, does the sawing. Uh, Mark tends to planing operations and maintenance. And Brian is responsible for the yard, unloading the trucks, stacking the logs, uh, delivering, and also where we all work in sales. I will say that I feel very fortunate and blessed to be working in a business using a natural resource with my sons who uh, are also my business partners. And that's an opportunity that not everyone has, so I, I feel very fortunate.